In many of my past videos, you've probably seen this desk before. Currently it's very messy, but that's not what I'm trying to show today. Today what I want to show is how, at the back of this room, over here, I have the whole Commodore 64 set up. I have a Commodore 64 with a CRT monitor, and a cassette reader as well as a floppy drive, and on top here is a MPS 803 printer. And in this video I want to show some of the programs I wrote a few years ago that calculate pi on the Commodore 64. First I want to show a few programs that are on this floppy disk, what I've called disk1. All I have to do is put the disk into the drive and type the dollar symbol. And because I have a fast load cartridge on this Commodore 64, this list of all the programs on the floppy disk is generated. First I want to show my most simple original algorithm that calculates pi. It's just this one that's called calculate pi. All you have to do to load it from the floppy disk is type load calculate pi and comma 8 and the comma 8 tells you that it's from the floppy disk drive. And now the program has loaded into the computer. I can clear the screen and list the program and here's what the program looks like. The most simple programs on the Commodore 64 are written in a language called BASIC and in this language instructions go line by line and each line starts with a number that gives the order of the lines. The way this first program works is that it generates random numbers on the XY plane inside this square and it counts the number of points that are inside the circle by checking if the X coordinate squared plus the Y coordinate squared is less than 1. And finding the ratio of the number of dots inside the circle and inside the whole square allows the program to calculate the value of pi. So that's exactly what this program is doing. The first line clears the screen then it sets a total counter and a counter for the number of dots inside the circle. It asks the user for the number of dots that they want and then generates the random points and checks if it's inside the circle. And at the end, prints the calculated value of pi. So if I run the program by just typing run and for example, ask for 20 iterations, each line here is the new calculated value of pi as more points are added. And we can see that this program is saying after 20 points, the value of pi is 3. And as we know, pi isn't 3, and just with 20 points, it's not too accurate. So we can run it again with even more points this time. With 200 points, now it's getting closer to the real value of pi. I'm back at the screen that lists the programs on the floppy disk. And the next program I want to show is this one called good calculate p. Now there's a reason why the naming is so weird. It's because these program names are limited to 16 characters, so this should say pi over here. And this was my next attempt at making a more efficient program for calculating pi. So I'll load the program and list what the program code looks like. This program here is using a very different algorithm. Instead of creating a circle and choosing random dots on a square, this one is looking at points along the circumference of a circle, or in this case, actually a quarter circle, and using Pythagoras or the distance formula to calculate the distance between each point. And by adding up the total distance, the program finds the circumference of this quarter circle, and from that you can calculate the value of pi. So that's exactly what this program does. Again, it starts by clearing the screen, and instead of having a circle that's always a radius of 1, and having smaller and smaller x subdivisions. Instead, this program always has the x's going up one at a time and just makes the entire quarter circle bigger for more accurate results. The value of y starts at zero, the total length starts at zero, and this line here, line 50, just prints a rough experimental estimate for the amount of time that the program will take. So then the program iterates x from minus r to zero, tracing through the entire quarter circle, calculates the appropriate y value at each point, finds the change in y and the resultant total change in length, like the hypotenuse of the right triangle, adds it to the total, and at the end calculates the corresponding value of pi. So if I run this program and choose a radius that's something like 30, saying the time will roughly be four seconds before it completes, and here it is, and the result that this calculated is 3.2, which is already as good as the previous one that took way longer. I can run the program again, this time with an even larger radius, something like 300. And this time the calculated value of pi is way closer to the real value. 
So you can see the second method that traces along the circumference is much better than just random guessing along the inside of a square. I have one more program that I want to show today. It's called Perfect Pi, and it's this one. It's not actually perfect. I just couldn't think of a better name at the time. It was the best algorithm that I came up with back then. So I could just load it directly from the floppy disk, or instead, here I have it also stored in this cassette drive. You can see I have it written here, the program Perfect Pi is stored between locations 45 and 53. And you might ask, what does this location mean? Well, looking at the cassette drive over here, once I put the cassette inside, there's a counter here at the side of the cassette drive. And as I fast forward the tape, this counter also increases. This counter actually shows the location of where you currently are on the tape. So since the program starts at 45, I have to keep fast forwarding until 45. And now that I'm at about the right place, all I have to do is type load on the computer and then press play on the tape. And you can see the tape slowly moves forward and I'm intentionally not fast forwarding just to show how slow it is for even such a short program. It's finally found the program. And only now will it continue loading. So now finally it's loaded the program from the tape and I can type list and it will show the whole program. It is slightly longer than the rest of the programs, but just as a comparison, there's an identical program on the floppy disk, also called Perfect Pi. And to load that, I can just type from device eight. It's searching, it's found it, and it's loaded, and it's ready way faster than the cassette drive. So the floppy drive over here, in my opinion, is certainly much simpler and much quicker than the cassette drive. But anyway, listing the program again, there are two main parts to this program. The main logic of this program is that it's using the fact that sine of pi is equal to zero. And if you just look at the function sine of x and try for values of x very close to pi, then you'll get results that are very close to zero. So as I wrote here, you can start from, for example, the number one and keep nudging upwards until the sine of x becomes less than zero. And now the problem is how exactly do you use a computer to calculate sine? Well, you can use the Taylor series for sine. And in order to do that, you need to first calculate the factorials of many odd numbers. And I tested a few upper bounds and I found that after about 11, the decimal precision of the Commodore 64 makes any additional terms not useful. So here in this program, k ranges from 1 all the way up to 11, and is all the odd numbers. So if I just list the first part of the program, this here is the part of the program that calculates the Fibonacci numbers so that it can be used later in the sine function. I set it to calculate the first 11 terms, and it's calculating using a for loop, where each term is being successively multiplied by this value a that's going up all the way to k. Once I have all the Fibonacci numbers in this thing called f, I can move on to the next part of the program. I think the best way to explain this part of the program is just by running it. So immediately as I run it, it will calculate the Fibonacci numbers. And that's here. These are the Fibonacci numbers. Now it's calculated and stored. And it starts from 0 and goes up 0, 1, 2, 3. And it finds the sine of 4. And the sine of 4 is negative. So it knows 4 is too big to be a value of pi then goes to the next digit, 3.1, 3.2 is too big. 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15 is negative, and so it's too big. 3.142 is negative, the sine of 3.142 is negative, so 3.142 is too big to be a value of pi. And it keeps moving along digit by digit, each time incrementing this digit to see if the sine of that new value is negative, and if the sine of that new value is negative, then it knows pi must be smaller than that. And as it keeps running and getting to the very last decimal place, the floating point errors start coming about. And you can see it goes from 61, 63, 64, 64, 66, 
That's not because of any problem with the code, but because at these very small values, the binary representations of these numbers start having a impact in how they're actually shown in base 10. So the final calculator value by this program is 3.14159264, but it should be 3.14159265. So at the very end, there's a tiny error because of the floating point precision, but otherwise, it's by far my fastest algorithm out of these few, just because it can go digit by digit, and each digit takes just as long as a previous one, rather than 10 times as long. The last thing I want to show today is this program, also on the same floppy disk, called PrintPy. And if I load it, and list it, it's almost the same program as the very first area random point one. Except with this one, I've made it so that it prints out the results on physical paper rather than just on the screen. So over here, I have the printer also made by Commodore connected to the computer. And if I just run the program and set it to, for example, 50 iterations, and that's choosing 50 random points, then the printer immediately starts printing. Now I can take off the cover so that it's slightly more visible. The print head is moving along the paper and going back and forth and printing out each result. This ink is quite faint, so you can barely see the numbers. But as more points are added, the approximate value of pi gets slightly better. And at the end, one more cool thing I can do is put this back on. advance the paper a bit with this paper advance button then because the end of the plastic here has some teeth on it I can just tear it off very satisfyingly and at the very bottom is the last calculator value of pi with 50 random points 2.72 again showing how this algorithm probably isn't the best there isn't really that much of a purpose to this printer certainly not for me well, the whole computer doesn't have that much of a purpose for me. But I think I'm interested in old computer and old technologies like these just because of how they're much simpler than the ones that we have today. And you can almost see every small component working. And that's why I decided to get all of these old pieces of equipment and learn how they work. Because I just find it very interesting to see how old technology like this works. I've not shown this before, but on this same shelf, hidden behind all of this clutter, I have an analog oscilloscope, and I also decided to get this some time ago just because that's how oscilloscopes used to work. The electricity would bend the electron beam up and down physically, and it was just interesting to get my hands on old technology like this. And on top of that, outside this room, right above where I keep my turret aimer, is this, a typewriter, fully functional. And next to that, a slide rule, and not even a slide rule, one that goes around in a circle. I've always loved to see old technology like this and how they're just so transparent and functional. So I hope this video has shown my interest in these pieces of old technology and hopefully you now share some of that sentiment with me too. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.